Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, a partner at Thompson Hine and president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm pleased to welcome you to the annual State of the Schools Address, the City Club Forum where we come together to hear about the health and progress of one of our region's most important assets the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Our speaker is Eric Gordon, the district's chief executive officer. Since passing the 15 mil levy that funded the Cleveland plan for transforming the schools five years ago, the Cleveland schools have been steadily improving. The most recent report card from the Ohio Department of Education shows progress. Graduation rates in the Cleveland schools are now over 78% an increase of 26% since the inception of the Cleveland Plan, with significant improvements. Yes, that's worthy of applause. There's also been significant improvements in the third grade reading guarantee and writing scores. In January, Cleveland was selected as the fourth community chapter of Say Yes to Education in the country. Say Yes to Education is a national nonprofit organization that works to help public school students graduate from high school, prepared for post-secondary education, and then provides tuition scholarships to make that education affordable. Mr. Gordon joins us today to talk about the successes and challenges of the Cleveland schools. We can expect to hear an update on how the Cleveland plan is working and learn more about the district's plans and priorities for assisting our children to achieve their full potential. Esteemed guests, members, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, and concerned citizens of Cleveland, I present to you for the 2019 State of the Schools Address, Eric Gordon, Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. So we do this every year. I'm a school guy. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. There we go. I am really privileged today to deliver my ninth State of the Schools Address to this distinguished audience of educators, families, partners, stakeholders, and supporters of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. I'm grateful to Dan Malthrop and his City Club staff and the City Club's partnership with IdeaStream for making it possible now for six years to open and televise this event to a much larger audience across our community, and to the generous sponsors of this event shown on your screens, who enable us to share the broader Cleveland community, the progress and achievements of Cleveland's public schools. Before I begin, I want to recognize a few people in attendance today. Mayor Frank G. Jackson, in his fourth term as mayor of Cleveland, has led our vision since the inception of the Cleveland Plan eight years ago. He continues to play a pivotal role in the transformation of CMSD from what was a repeatedly failing school district to what today is a continuously improving one. Instrumental in the progress as well it, over the last nine years has been the consistency and outstanding leadership of the Cleveland Board of Education. Our board is known and recognized nationally for its unparalleled service and dedication to public education. With us today are Board Chair Ann Bingham, Vice Chair Robert Hurd, and board members Denise Link and Sarah Ellicott. Also with us today are community partners who helped to shape and who continue to support the Cleveland Plan, and more recently to support our efforts to bring Say Yes to Education here to Cleveland. The Greater Cleveland Partnership, the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gunn Foundation, 
the Cleveland Council of Administrators and Supervisors, the Cleveland Teachers Union, Breakthrough Charter Schools, the City of Cleveland, County Executive Armin Budish and Cuyahoga County, the United Way of Greater Cleveland, and College Now Greater Cleveland. Thank you all for your incomparable support of public education over the past nine years, and in particular for all you've done the last two years to secure the game-changing services, supports, and scholarships for students and families, making say Cleveland a say yes to education city. And we all owe a debt of gratitude to the people of the Cleveland School District, whose support of issue 107, issue four, and issue 108 has enabled us not only to implement and sustain reforms outlined in the Cleveland Plan, but also to modernize and revitalize schools across the city. Please help me thank all of these people, both here today and across our community, for their tremendous ongoing support. So, what is the state of our schools? I would say that the state of our schools and the state of the Cleveland Plan can best be described by the words and teachings of Sir Isaac Newton. Newton, as many of you know, is credited as one of the inventors of calculus, I was a math teacher, and a significant contributor to the scientific field of physics. You may know him best for Newton's cradle, a fun object on many of our desks to satisfy our fascination with the physics concept of momentum. In reflecting on CMSD's steady growth and progress under the Cleveland Plan, and particularly on the gains we've seen over the last year, I found myself thinking about Newton's three laws of motion. Newton's first law, which explains inertia, states that every object in a state of rest will remain in that state of rest, and any object in a state of uniform motion will remain in that state of motion unless an external force acts on it. In 2011, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District was at rest. Ranked last out of Ohio's 609 school districts, we were financially bankrupt and had lost all public trust. Civic and business leaders and citizens, residents, and taxpayers across our district and community have given up hope that CMSD could achieve anything higher than last place in the state. We were an F on every indicator of performance. In a system clearly at rest, it was widely believed that as Newton's first law states, Cleveland's public schools would simply remain at rest, and there was no force capable of changing that. Newton's second law describes the force needed to move an object that is in a state of rest. Force, in Newton's terms, equals mass times acceleration. In other words, mathematically speaking, acceleration equals force over mass. And to get positive acceleration, one needs a force larger than the mass it's trying to move. What acceleration would Cleveland need to move the enormous mass at rest that was the Cleveland Metropolitan School District? In Cleveland, that force was, and still is today, the Cleveland Plan. And with it, hundreds of leaders across the city and state that created it and continue to support it. And as Newton's first law predicts, once the force of the Cleveland Plan was applied to the mass of the district, CMSD began moving, continued to move, and is continuously moving today. Isaac Newton used a combination of his first and second law to define momentum, a physics concept that measures the quantity of an object's motion as a product of its mass and velocity. So what is the state of our schools today? Well, I would say that in Newton's terms, the mass that is the Cleveland Metropolitan School District is not only accelerating its progress, but it's gaining momentum. But if I'm going to talk in terms of math and science, then my scholars and educators in the audience today are going to immediately ask to see the evidence to support my hypothesis that CMSD is actually gaining momentum. So let's look at that evidence. In K-3 literacy improvement, CMSD improved another 2.6 percentage points last school year, with 85.3% of last year's third graders meeting the state's third grade guarantee. This K-3 literacy measure has increased 4.4 percentage points since the measure was created in 2014. 4.4 percentage points may not seem like much, but that increase makes CMSD the only urban district in Ohio to see an increase of any kind on this measure in that same period of time. 
It also puts... It also puts CMSD in the top 15% of growth among Ohio's 609 school districts. And the 85.3% proficiency rate in third grade reading was earned by a class of students who, when entering kindergarten, showed only 33% were kindergarten ready for literacy. That's momentum. CMSD's performance index, a score measuring reading and math in third through 12th grades, has consistently increased for four consecutive years, up 5.4 percentage points since the new, more rigorous Ohio State tests were put into place in 2016. The growth we saw is the second largest gain among Ohio's urban districts. It positions CMSD among the top 25 fastest improving districts in Ohio, placing us in the top 4% for growth on this measure statewide. And that's momentum. On Ohio's gap closing measure, a measure added to the report card in 2016, CMSD moved from an F in 2016 and 17 to a D in 2018, and with another seven point gain last year to a C in gap closing on this year's report card, meaning the performance. <laughs> This C is particularly important because it means the performance gap for our minority students is closing compared to their white peers statewide, and that's momentum. And our four-year on-time graduation rate, a measure that has seen consistent growth year after year, increased another 3.6 percentage points again this year, setting another district record high of 78.2%. This marks the ninth straight year of improvement in our graduation rate, a 26-point gain from 52.2% in 2011 to the 78.2% today. And with a national average at 84%, CMSD is quickly closing that gap. Our four-year graduation rate showed the fourth fastest growth in Ohio out of 609 school districts, ranking us in the top 1% of growth statewide. And our five-year graduation rate of 81.5% is the highest graduation rate for any urban district in Ohio. For a district that so not, not so long ago was dead last among these districts, that's momentum. Together, the momentum we are seeing from kindergarten to third grade literacy improvements, the momentum we are seeing on test scores from third grade through high school, and the momentum we are seeing on continuously increasing graduation rates earned us an overall grade of D on this year's report card, up from the F we earned last year. I want to make it clear, we are not celebrating a D. All that moving from an F to a D tells us is that we continue to move upward, but that we also have a lot more yet to achieve. However, even our harshest critics must acknowledge that while we have not yet arrived, we are certainly on our way. Being among the fastest improving school districts in Ohio on K-3 literacy, performance index, and graduation rate, that's momentum. But what does it all mean? What does a D school district really look like? Well, in the John Marshall School of Information Technology, students recently upgraded a website for the Federal Bar Association of Northern Ohio and then created an app for the Bar Association to use to make their website mobile friendly. And these students are doing that work on computers they actually built themselves. Special education students in fifth through eighth grades at Clara E. Westrop School run their own cafe that is open to staff and parents. The students apply, interview for jobs, use what they learn in life skills and math classes to take orders, prepare food, and manage cash registers. Students at Aerospace, Davis Aerospace and Maritime High School with access to flight simulators and a rescue boat focus their, students in STEM, their studies in STEM education across these two vital industries in Cleveland. And this summer, junior Sydney Marie Flowers flew her first solo flight, earning a federal flight certificate through this innovative high school. Students at School of One classrooms at the Foundry, Cleveland's Community Rowing and Sailing Center, 
attended a summer program at Case Western Reserve University to learn how to make a prosthetic hand for one of their classmates who could not row with his class because he had lost his hand as a child. And for those of you who are wondering, School of One is designed to serve scholars most school districts call at risk of dropping out. At CMSD, we call them college bound. Students at Artemis Ward. <laughs> Students at Artemis Ward use art and music to create a stop animation film that can be presented on an array of TV sets that project the students' work with a soundtrack written by their principal. Their class production will be showcased at Cleveland's Ingenuity Fest this coming weekend. At Max Hayes High School, students developed synthetic gasoline, put it in the gas tank of their teacher's car, and watched as he successfully drove the car home that night and back to school in the morning. <laughs> students at this same high school rebuilt a police car destroyed in the city's celebration of the Cavaliers championship victory in 2016 <laughs> returning the car like new to the Cleveland Police Department. <laughs> Middle school students at Daniel E. Morgan School, as part of an after-school program sponsored by Central State University, planted seeds in a tower garden to study how plants and vegetables grow without soil. The scholars researched hydroponic and aeroponic technologies and applied math skills to create charts and graphs in plant growth over time and to compare vegetables grown in soil with those grown in their aeroponic system. Residents and visitors to Cleveland have witnessed the success of students at Jane Addams Business Career Center, who not only run a restaurant that is open to the public, but last year took those skills on the road with a food truck that became one of the popular stations on Walnut Wednesday. And that food truck, formerly a CMSD school bus, was converted into a mobile restaurant by their friends at Max Hayes High School. <laughs> Logan Williams, a sixth grader at Wade Park School, created a program called Blanket Blessings, in which she collected over 300 blankets to personally hand out to homeless adults and children along with care bags she keeps in her mother's car. <laughs> Logan's Blanket Blessings project is now being featured at the Cleveland History Center in the Celebrate Those Who Give Black exhibit as an exemplar of extraordinary commitment to her community. Students at Cleveland School of the Arts wrote and produced their own play about gun violence in America. Their production, The Right to Bear Arms, was presented in the school's black box theater for not one, but two consecutive runs of standing room only audiences, and was followed by a discussion where the audience engaged with the performers about gun violence and gun control efforts across this nation. Some of the students, teachers, and principals from these schools are here today. Would each of you please stand to be recognized, all of those young people that were featured today. These are 10 of any number of examples that I could have lifted up from any school in this district. While it may be difficult to know what a D means on a state report card, you only need to visit a classroom in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District to see and feel the difference and understand what momentum is, what it looks like in action, and what impact these changes are having on the way Cleveland's kids think, learn, and act. Each and every day, our scholars take on complex academic tasks like these that are not easily measured by test scores as they find increasingly op increasing opportunities to demonstrate their learning authentically. And our educators work hard to create joyful and adventurous classrooms where this more complex learning can occur every day for every child. In fact, would all of the CMSD students and educators here please stand and be recognized since I couldn't lift every example of the great work you're all doing. Please, students and educators. I 
I encourage you to visit with any of these students and educators to ask about the examples that you didn't see but are happening every day in the district. Even as we've been gaining momentum over the past nine years, the people of Cleveland have continued to increase the force applied to our success. Last January, we reached another significant milestone. After hundreds of people from across our community worked tirelessly behind the scenes for over two years to, pos to position us to become a Say Yes to Education city. Mayor Jackson called the Say Yes to Education the next logical step in the Cleveland plan, and it is. I am pleased to share that the Say Yes Cleveland office is now open, the first round of Say Yes to Education scholarships are out the door, and the first 16 Say Yes service and support schools are now in place. Even those who are part of our two-year quest to become a Say Yes city sometimes find it difficult to explain to others all that Say Yes to Education can do for our kids and our community. I would describe it simply as creating for Cleveland's children and families the capital and social capital that middle and upper middle income families already enjoy. I'll explain using four quick examples. A few years ago, a student from Mound School in Slavic Village missed large numbers of days because he made, needed to make frequent trips to the emergency room to, to treat his acute asthma. But when, he, when we established our partnership with Metro Health to install a school-based health clinic at Mound, our school and hospital staff were able to provide him with primary care before he had acute asthmatic attacks. His attendance increased dramatically, and so did his grades. By providing health and mental health services in our schools, Say Yes will provide for our scholars the access to primary health care that most of us in this room already enjoy. That's the capital Say Yes brings to our schools. Last year, I worked with another student who boarded the RTA Health Line but didn't pay the $2.25 honor system ticket for the ride. He got caught and arrested. He was released but had to go to court to schedule a hearing where he would be sentenced for the crime. The student didn't show up for the case, and a $5,000 warrant was issued for his arrest for a $2.25 bus ticket. Fortunately, I was able to call a friend who is an attorney to intervene on this young man's behalf. Had I not learned of the incident or took the time to intervene, that young man, who had been in some trouble in the past, could have sat 60 meaning he could have spent up to 60 days in jail for a $2.25 bus ticket. Putting legal clinics in our schools is the capital Say Yes to Education creates. The relationship that allowed me to phone a friend on this young man's behalf, that's the social capital that middle and upper middle income families already enjoy. What this kid did was wrong. It's just as wrong when it happens in a suburban community. What's different in urban districts, however, is the consequence of the action. And that fate is often driven by the social capital the offender either has or does not have. With family support specialists as advocates in every school, Say Yes can create that social capital for our kids and families where currently there is none. Another student I know was a fourth year student at Morehouse College. He was clearly successful. You don't get to your senior year of college at Morehouse any other way. And yet, one Sunday morning, I walked into the Landmark Diner on St. Clair Avenue, and there he was, sitting in a booth. I was surprised to see him because colleges had already resumed classes, so I went over and asked him why he wasn't back at school. He told me that he was $800 short and he couldn't pay his tuition. $800. Fortunately, we were able to get him transferred into Cleveland State University where he finished his degree. But the point here is that no child's college success should depend on where I happen to have breakfast. Say Yes to Education's last dollar tuition scholarships creates the capital needed to ensure that this story can't happen again to a CMSD graduate. One of the young men I mentor is studying to be a professional actor. Knowing this, I brought him to a gala event at Karamu House so that he could interact with the country's oldest professional African-American acting troupe. Through those relationships and the student's talent, I later got to watch him in a Karamu production of, of Aida. That access to Karamu's gala is the social capital. By adding a College Now mentor to every SEA scholarship, we are now able to keep track of our students and support them as they go through college 
but also our students will have built relationships with a mentor in a similar profession that will have the social capital to help them enter their chosen field upon graduation. With the added force of Say Yes to Education, we are certain to continue to gain momentum year after year toward our goal of ensuring that every child in Cleveland attends a high quality school and that every neighborhood has a multitude of great schools from which families can choose. I started the speech today by talking about Newton's laws, but up to now I haven't mentioned Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That law implies that our momentum can be stopped if an equal and opposite reaction is applied. So why is that important? For me, at least, it's an important reminder that we cannot rest. It's a reminder that we must maintain and build upon our momentum, but at the same time, pay attention to the forces that threaten to slow us or even stop us. We must, for example, keep in mind that the 15 mil levy supported by district taxpayers for the past seven years expires next year. Without the continued trust and support of taxpayers, all the momentum we are gaining can be lost. It also means we must continue to examine not only the quality of our schools, but also the number of schools needed across all sectors of our community, whether they are district, charter, or parochial schools, so that we can spend our community's precious resources more deeply in fewer schools instead of spreading them thinly across more schools than we need. It will also mean that we need to ensure every Clevelander and especially every Cleveland child is counted in the critically important upcoming U.S. Census that will guide federal and state funding. <laughs> A census that will guide federal and state funding for CMSD, the city and the county, for other youth serving program programming for the next decade. We cannot let an equal and opposite reaction of any form disrupt our momentum. Isaac Newton, whose three laws appear in the Principia Mathematica, was hailed by his fellow physicists for what they called the greatest scientific work ever written. And yet his work was widely attacked on metaphysical grounds. To differentiate the two, one writer describes it this way. Physicists want to understand how a rock falls to the ground. Metaphysicians want to know what it means to be a rock. Newton's three laws help us to understand why the rock falls to the ground and why planets go around the sun. To set a rock in motion, I must first reach for it and pick it up or push it. I cannot simply will the rock to move. Similarly, gravity sets a falling rock in motion but does it by imparting a force from a distance. But while Newton was adept at explaining the laws of gravity, he stayed carefully away from trying to explain what gravity actually was. Gravity explains the motion of the planets, he said, but it cannot explain who set the planets in motion. Today, I used Newton's three laws to explain the motion of the district, but I'm gonna tackle the answer of the metaphysical question, who set the district in motion? In 2011, I challenged this audience to envision what it would look like if we truly invested in a transformational approach to education in Cleveland, and if we sustained that investment. When the Cleveland Metropolitan School District faced fiscal and academic failure, the people of Cleveland invested in an extraordinary vision of the changes needed to move a failing district. And the forward movement we are seeing in the district today shows these people did much more than invest in vision. They made it happen. You made it happen. The Cleveland Plan was set in motion at a time when struggling school districts across America were waiting for forces from a distance to come to their cities and move their districts that were at rest. But here, the Cleveland Plan was put into motion by courageous and visionary people in this city who refused to wait for change to happen to us. We refuse to let forces outside our city impose reforms on our school system. We created instead our own blueprint for radical change and then set it in motion. Many members of the Cleveland Plan Coalition are scattered throughout this room, this city, this county, and this state, including legislators on both sides of the aisle who believed in the vision and passed it into legislation. These are the forces that set our educational universe in motion in Cleveland, 
and to each and every one of you, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude. On behalf of the children of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, and on behalf of the hardworking educators to whom our scholars' families have entrusted their future, thank you. Thank you for believing in them and in us. Because of your vision, your investment, your ongoing commitment and support, CMSD is a vastly different place than we were in 2011. And now, as a Sayesta education city, with the scholarships and family support services it brings to our community, our momentum can only accelerate. How? By applying a strong contravailing force against the greatest threat to our children's success and future, poverty. To the people in this room and across this community whose vision and unwavering support brought us here, I am happy to report that the state of our schools is stronger and measurably better than at any time in recent history. Each of you helped to put the district in motion, so now let's accelerate our gains, let's build on that momentum. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you and have a good day. Today at the City Club, at the Renaissance Cleveland Hotel, Eric Gordon, CEO of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, is presenting the 2019 State of the Schools Address. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone. May we have the first question, please? Uh, good afternoon. My name, my name is Merle Johnson. I'm a member of the Ohio uh, Board of Education, and I want to congratulate you on the continuous improvement. And thank you for mentioning the importance of the census. Um, my question is, yesterday I was talking to someone about the wraparound services that are so important in the CES education program. They mentioned that the person who was coordinating those services, uh, one of the requirements was they had to have a master's in social work. And I don't know if that's correct, but could you talk about the requirements for the person who's going to be actually coordinating the wraparound services for Say Yes to Education? Certainly, thank you very much. So the services are coordinated by a family support specialist who is actually employed by Say Yes, so independent of the district. Um, and they do uh, require a, a master's degree in social work because of the kinds of needs and supports they'll provide to families. Uh, the, student, the, fa the family support specialist is then able to work with every student and their family with a database of over 3,500 services that are available in Cleveland so that if a student presents with any kind of need, they can immediately access that database and match that student with the service. So in addition to the service being brought into the school, the health, the mental health, the legal services, after school programs, if a child doesn't have food, that social worker can access the food bank and the food pantries. If they don't have glasses, they can find an optometrist. So it's very much a case management protocol using the, the um, responsibilities of a trained social worker. Thank you. Oh. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Gordon. I'm Tanaya Parker from Glenville High School, and I would like to know what plans do you have outlined for Glenville High School over the 2020 and 2021 school year? Certainly, thank you. So first, since Glenville's up there, I almost had Glenville in the speech because they actually uh, did a documentary on the Glenville riots where they actually traveled to Alabama to interview people uh, from the riots. So this is another demonstration of great learning, so congratulations, Glenville. Um, I want to say that you asked the right question at the right time. This Saturday, we are starting community meetings that will go on through uh, September, October, and up to November, where we're going to be talking about Glenville and all of our high schools to determine the long-term strategy um, past this school year with all of our high schools. So the current answer to your question is, I don't yet know, because I'm going to the community to gather feedback and input. So I would encourage you to attend those meetings. They're all the same, so you can attend the one that's closest to you and make sure that we have your input. And then and we'll come back to the community in November and update the community on our proposed plans for next year and beyond. Thank you for your question. Good afternoon. Dr. Carlton Mathis from the United Way of Greater Cleveland. I have a two-part question. The first part is you mentioned the district in the aggregate, but what specific segments of the student population have had the most growth in outcomes in the last eight years? And more importantly, what is the plan for all students, including the 20-odd percent that don't graduate on time, to meet the three E's of 
enlistment, employment, or most importantly, post-secondary education. Thank you. So the good news is that all of our student groups are moving. So uh, this year, for example, we saw significant gains in English language learners. Um, our minority populations, our two largest are African American and Hispanic. They're actually the two fastest moving groups. Um, our students with disabilities closed gaps and actually improved in their rating. So the good news is from kindergarten through 12th grade and at all um, subgroups, we're moving. And so there isn't like a hot spot that's moving and carrying the district. It is a community movement. Uh, to the question of those that do not graduate on time, um, say yes is our pathway for formal post-secondary training, a certificate, a two-year or a four-year program. But simultaneously with the leadership of our board chair and in partnership with the Cleveland Foundation, we are working on a, uh, a pathway strategy for students who are either going to use micro-credentials and not formal secondary education or going straight into the workforce so that those students have an equally deliberately prepared pathway post high school. And while the 78% represents those who graduate on time, we keep those students that didn't graduate in for a fifth year so that, that, that they do get their diploma. So our goal is that we have a spectrum from four year to two year to technical certificate to micro-credential to employment and not drop out. And that work is actually launching tomorrow. So we are actively aware of that group and working on it to complement what we're doing with Say Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Gordon. Um, my name is Charlie Lewis. I'm from Cleveland School of Science and Medicine. And some of my peers and I would like to know when can we get art, like band and choir and photography back into our high schools to increase the student body morale? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So this is another space that over years and years in public education and particularly urban education, districts got really focused on reading and math and took away lots of other things like art and music and those other things. Uh, so we have now been working on an arts plan for the district. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Allen, who works for the district, is actually leading a community committee that is designed to start reintroducing not only high school programs, but a more robust program from preschool all the way to high school. Uh, we've actually had some examples of that where schools are starting to do it. So John Marshall, as an example, has reintroduced marching band and drumline. Uh, but Mr. Allen is actually working on a plan that we hope to launch next school year to start reintroducing those kinds of programs at your school and across the district. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Gordon. My name is Harriet Applegate with the North Shore AFL-CIO. And given that this week, this week for future, is the week where millions of students, mostly uh, secondary school students, are strike, climate striking all over the world. Uh, and given that um, in here in Cleveland, we bo both the city and the county have both have very robust programs to address climate change. And finally, given that uh, the new young hero of the world, Greta Thunberg, keeps emphasizing that uh, the main reason that people are not doing anything is that they are uninformed. Can you, and of course, we are, you are in the business of in, informing and educating. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as uh, the Cle CMSD's role in making sure that we become informed about uh, the climate crisis, which has started to accelerate itself and uh, poses great risks for everybody, given that this all has been led by students, secondary students all over the world. Yeah, thank you. So I think that it's supposed to start in schools. We are the people that are educating the next generation of leaders that will stand on this stage or in your space or in, in civic leadership. Uh, I think it's a combination of education and participation. So uh, the climate change issues are a part of our science, science curriculum that our teachers are teaching. But more importantly, uh, because again, like you saw, we want students to actually be in authentic experiences. We have a place-based science program where every student from kindergarten through uh, eighth grade goes out into our community assets, including the Shaker Nature Center, where they actually physically experience what good climate experiences are like so that they're learning from preschool and kindergarten about these kinds of issues. 
Um, and then we, we have our students advocating. So a student from uh, John Hayes Science and Medicine, for example, is our local version of that advocate. Uh, she actually uh, came to a national conference of urban educators and presented her passion around environmental safety and climate control. Uh, so it, it moves from educating and participating to advocating. And you can see examples of that in classrooms across the district. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Michaela Rowell. I'm from um, Wade Park. And my question for you today, if you was to make one change in Cleveland schools, what would that change be? My change would be, I always get the hardest questions from the students. It happens every year. This is actually a really easy one for me, and it's what I tried to do today. My change would be to get rid of what I call the CMSD stink. People see and hear our name and immediately think things can't be going well because it's an urban district, because it's Cleveland schools. They don't know you. And they don't know all of these kids that are doing amazing things in our classrooms and our educators that are doing amazing things in our classrooms. If I had a magic wand, it would be for them to look at you like they look at suburban districts. Because we're Cleveland, they must not be doing good when in fact you're doing great in your classroom and these other students across this district are doing the same thing. That's what I would change. Hello, my name is Megan Thompson. I am the Senior Programs Manager at Center for Arts Inspired Learning. Uh, I'm very excited for the Say Yes initiative here in Cleveland, and we've heard a lot about the wraparound services that are going to be provided K through 12, as well as the scholarships, but I was wondering if you could speak a bit to what measures are in place to ensure students are choosing an appropriate college and college program and preparing them for success once they reach college. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we, are, uh, we have to remember that Say Yes is both an immediate and a long-term strategy. So we have to be thinking about what we're going to be doing 20, 25 years from now, even as we're doing something immediately. Uh, the most immediate work we've done is training with our uh, high school counselors and the College Now partnership advisors that we have on joint messaging about how to select colleges differently now that you have different kinds of choices because our students in the past really were looking for a college that they might be able to afford instead of a college that might be able to support them the best. So now we can say you do not use affordability as your number one indicator. You look for a college that has the quality of life that you want, that has the educational experience that you want, that has the community supports that you want. Um, and simultaneously, we're talking to colleges about this. So I was just at Mount Union College who wants to recruit more CMSD students. And I said, well, what are you going to do when you recruit our minority students who are now suddenly isolated in an all-white community? What are the supports that you have in place when I feel alone and when depression sets in and the other challenges? So we're simultaneously talking to those colleges that are selecting us and saying to colleges who are doing these things, like Cleveland State University, why they're so important for our kids and challenging those who have not yet started to do those things about how they have to be ready to embrace and support our kids if they're going to try to take advantage of the program. So that's kind of a snapshot of where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Gordon. My name is Dan Cohen, and I'm from Way Park School. And my question for you is, what is your favorite part of your job? <laughs> my favorite part is you. It's being in the schools, being, uh, getting to interact with the work that you're doing and visiting in your classrooms. And, um, you know, whenever I have a really, really bad day, I just drive to the nearest school I can, and I get inside, and suddenly my day's a lot better. Uh, I had um, on Tuesday was our board business meeting at Harvey Rice School and I had a really tough day that day. It started at 5 a.m. We were dealing so with some tough issues um, and I frankly was not loving being at the board meeting. Sorry, board members. <laughs> and, then, and then the cheer squad and steppers came out and, de and demonstrated their learning in just these few first weeks of school and I immediately felt better. So it's you. So thank you. Hi, Eric Gordon. My name is Ayanna Blake, and, my, and I go to Way Park School. And my question for you is, what is your biggest accomplishment from last year? What was your biggest accomplishment for last year? Wow. OK, Way Park, sit down. <laughs> no, no, no. 
thank you. Um, so when I took this job, um, I made three commitments. The first was that I could prove we could move academics in this district. Cleveland has the highest childhood poverty in the nation. Detroit is number two. And so there are a lot of people that think because we experience poverty, you can't make improvements. So my first one was to move achievement, and we've shown that. But I always knew that it didn't matter if you, and what grade are you? I'm in seventh grade. So if, if a seventh grader doesn't know that she's going to college, then all of that work to improve doesn't work. So my second was to make sure that I could say to you, not if you go to college, but when you go to college, what do you plan to do? And I also knew that I couldn't say to you, here's the money, go, if we didn't help block and tackle the things that get in way. We had a tragedy yesterday, and, and that tragedy just reminds me, uh, we, we lost a student and another student's life is, is, might as well be lost. And it's because we weren't able to get in the way of the things that were happening to those kids when they were young. So my greatest accomplishment last year was being a very small part of this coalition of people that made this Say Yes to Education program happen because it completes my second and my third goal for you. So, and, it, and I'm one really small part of it, but that's still something I'm really proud of. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Golden. My name is Liliana Nelson. I'm a senior at Face and History New Tech. And as a student at Face and History New Tech, I speak on behalf of not only the student body, but the needs in my community. We have a... <laughs> You're doing great. I'm doing... I'm concerned on our, on our growth as a school. Um, we are the only high school that shares a space with K-8 school. As a face and history student, we want to expand to teach students and teachers how to make a difference, but how, to we, how can we do this with such a small place to walk in? We want to make a, commu a community where we can teach lots of kids how to be a leader, we still want to be in the old Brooklyn area, but we want to expand and do, oops, I lost my spot. That's all right. Ex so you need a bigger home is what I'm hearing you asking me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> you're asking the right question at the right time. So like I shared with the Glenville student earlier, this weekend on Saturday, we're actually starting community meetings across both the west and east sides of the city to talk about our high schools, all of them, including Facing History, to look at what are the long-term homes for our high schools, uh, where do programs land. We know, for example, that Facing History is a, a cherished part of the old Brooklyn community, so how can we think about uh, the potential of a new K-8 school that might create space in the Mooney building and then repurposing the Mooney for your school as an example. Those conversations are starting this Saturday, so I would encourage you and your school community, students and adults alike, to attend one of those meetings. They're all five are the same, so you don't need to attend five times, but attend one of those on both the first and second round so that you help inform the decisions that I'll ultimately bring to the board on your behalf. Thank you. Up next, we have a question from Twitter, which states, September is Child Obesity Awareness Month, and last week, 12 CMSD schools received National Healthy School recognition. How is CMSD continuing to build momentum to build a culture of health that improves academic performance? Thank you. So yes, we did have 12 schools that won the National Healthy School Award, so I think that's worth celebrating, so congratulations to them. 
So we know that, that health has to be thought in a total wellness strategy. So we have to continue to think about physical education and we have a national physical education grant that allows us to uh, really focus on wellness through physical education and making sure that physical education is not, not the old school, we all play volleyball, but that we're actually learning to be healthy when we become adults. So we're learning how to use fitness centers and those sorts of things. It's nutrition, and so it's about healthy and nutritious snacks that we provide. It's about uh, nutritious lunches, which are in some ways bound by federal nutrition guidelines that I would argue uh, not, aren't probably as up to date as we would like them to be. Um, it's also about you know your uh, your mental health, and so we have a humanware strategy that supports kids and families um, when they have needs or are in crisis, and it's sexual health, and so we have a robust robust sexual health program too, uh, so that students from kindergarten all the way through high school are learning learning what good touch and bad touch is early, so that they're protected and healthy. So we really think about health as a total wellness strategy, of which National Obesity Month and the uh, uh, food, food health and fitness health are a part. So thank you again for the question. Good afternoon, Mr. Gordon. My name is Jade Del Orbe, and I am a junior facing at Srinutek. A tragic event happened in our neighborhood yesterday afternoon. Sadly, a young man died just a block or so away from our school due to violence. What is CMSD's response to care for the students who are affected when such things happen? Is there an, an increase in police response on the streets? Does the district send support staff to schools for emotional needs? We just want to be safe. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that we had a tragic loss uh, of a student death and then another student whose life is forever changed because of his involvement. Um, unfortunately, those things happen in our community still far too frequently and it needs to be both a district and a community response because the student is, is a student of our school for six hours a day. They are a resident of our community 24 hours a day. Um, in tragedies like that, we have a protocol called the Rapid Response Team. Uh, we deploy a number of school psychologists and grief counselors, so those um, people were deployed to our, uh, the school that was involved today, and they will stay on site uh, until the school community tells us that they're no longer needed. In fact, literally before I stepped on this stage, I was texting with the school to make sure they had enough support in place. We also increased our CMSD police presence so that people felt the physical safety uh, and are working very closely with the Cleveland police uh, who actually uh, increased their presence in the community so that there's a, a physical presence. But we have to solve this, as I said earlier, by getting in front of the things that cause young people to feel like this is the only choice they have. Because we, we do not have the resources, the district or the city, to chase around people who, after these tragedies have happened. We've got to keep working to get in front of them. And that's when you're going to feel really safe, is when you know that kids aren't feeling so desperate that the only resort they have is the tragedy that occurred yesterday. So thank you again for your question. Hi, um, my name is Sydney Marie Flowers, and I attend Our Davis. Our pilot. Yes. <laughs> um. So my, well, I'm sorry, I might tear up because um, my cousin knew the boy who passed away yesterday. Hey. I'm sorry. You're fine. Okay, so um, my question actually came up from um, when you spoke about the boy who was going to go to jail for um, a bus ticket. What are um, the ways that you can help kids that you haven't identified yet who are still in that predicament, but you're not, you're not necessarily able to help them because you don't know that they are in that predicament? And I have a Second question, um, what are ways that you can help kids that are in poverty and are not able to get their pilot's license or who aren't able to succeed in life because they are in poverty? Yeah, so the, the program that I was explaining earlier called the Sayesta Education, that's our long-term response. And it is a long-term because we can't 
undo everything that's happened by living in poverty in a minute, right? Um, but what we're trying to replicate is I won't ever get to know all 37,000 of you. I wish I could, and, and I think of you as my own kids. My wife knows it because we have some that now we have grandkids. Um, but the reality is I, I will never actually know every one of you and will not be able to say, oh, something happened, I'll get in your way. So over the next four years, we're implementing these family support specialists in every school so that you have somewhere to go as a, a kid and say, I'm in trouble. I got in trouble and I need help. What do I do? Um, because you deserve that place to go, just like anybody who has the resources to go to mom and dad and say, mom and dad, I'm in trouble. So that's those family support specialists. And as far as making sure kids in poverty have access to that pilot's license, we are committed um, and we, we think of every single student as a student in some level of need. And so the district will put the resources behind that license so that it's not only available to you, but it's available to others. And we do that with partnerships with people in these rooms. Uh, the, the people in these rooms are very, very generous in creating, you know, that when I say, I've got this kid that could qualify for their aviation flight certificate, but they can't pay the fee, they show up and they help us. And so um, it, it's a short and long-term game, but those family support specialists are really intended to be one in every school that, that you can go to and say, here's my $2.25 bus ticket. It was a stupid thing to do. What do I do now? Because you know what? Adults do it too, but we all do dumb things sometime, and we need a way out, and that's what this is supposed to do for you. And congratulations again. Today, the City Cub is at the Renaissance Cleveland Hotel, where we have been listening to Eric Gordon, the CEO of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, present the 2019 State of the Schools Address. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.